May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Your fellow redeemed. It seems like we are surrounded by amazing amounts of artistic talent. I was watching that movie Soul the other day, and you can practically count the mustache hairs on the main character. Movies come out every year where the, the animation and the graphics are so good that it actually makes you believe that giant purple people with wrinkly chins actually exist, or killer robots, or Godzilla. Video games these days are coming out with photorealistic graphics that are even more engrossing. But that's nothing new. We've had very gifted artists among us for a long time. To the point where you can go to a museum and I'm looking at a painting and it doesn't really strike my fancy and I don't even think about the amazing amount of talent that the artist had to paint a picture like that. And isn't that how life is? We are surrounded by amazing works of art and sometimes we don't even take notice. Babies are being born. People are speeding home on the highway and arriving safely. The process of evaporation and condensation continues unabated. Amazing things are happening. Here we sit in a church aside a mountain that overlooks a beautiful desert landscape. How often do we really stop to notice these works of art all around us? A few minutes ago, you and I spoke responsively the verses of Psalm 19. And thankfully, David, the composer of Psalm 19, is leading us to admire the artwork in this world. But he's drawing us to admire the artist himself. But if we think that his artistry and his talent and his creativity stops just at nature, well, that's not even half of it. So to appreciate the artist, David would have us look up. He says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of his hands. And isn't that true? When you look up, what do you see? Usually in El Paso, you see a lot of blue, not a whole lot of clouds. You feel small, maybe. On a clear night, you see the stars, you see the planets. You see the amazing work of God. You notice how the sun can rise and set and warm the earth and keep us alive. If it missed just a day of doing its job, what life could survive on planet earth? And yet it all fits together. The earth rotates on its axis. We don't go careening to our death. We're able to stand here and be alive and be together. This is a work of art of God, is it not? That's why it's so sad whenever somebody says that the Bible is just a primitive book with no scientific relevance. When we read Psalm 19, did David say anything that was scientifically inaccurate? Is it scientifically inaccurate to describe in a beautiful way the sun rises and sets? No. Is it scientifically inaccurate to look up at the sky and see all the beautiful things God has done? No. In fact, science at its best only confirms that somebody really intelligent, somebody really powerful was behind all of this. When you look at the central nervous system of a human being, when you look at the sky, look at the way the trees grow and the grass grows, somebody powerful and intelligent was behind this, truly an artist. Van Gogh was a very talented artist. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. A lot of art aficionados still puzzle over his brilliance of his paintings like Starry Night and stuff like that. But by all reports, you would not have wanted to hang out with Vincent Van Gogh. Vincent Van Gogh does not seem like the kind of guy that you would grab a beer with after work. He does not seem like the kind of guy that you would want to watch your kids. Now, Van Gogh was a brilliant artist, but I think people, by and large, were happy to just look at the art without having a relationship with him. See, admiring the works of art of a brilliant artist 
is not enough to really know them on a personal level, is it? Even if you buy all the biographies about a particular artist written by art historians, you, get, you can get to know facts about their life, but you won't have a relationship with them. So somebody can go on a hike through the mountains or through a national park forest. Someone can spend a weekend at the lake. Someone can enjoy all the blessings of God's creation and just admire the work of art that he has done in this world. But that is not enough to have a relationship with him. And you know what? It's not all that comforting. Does it help you in your struggles? to know that God is wise? Does it help you with what you're going through right now just to know that God is powerful? Because those facts are true, but those facts alone aren't very comforting if you think about it. If God is all wise and he knows everything and he was so intelligent that he made up my brain, then he knows the thoughts my brain has had. If God was the one who intelligently designed my soul, then he knows the deepest, darkest secrets of my soul. If God is so powerful that he can create the universe, that he can set the earth on its axis and make sure everything fits together so that life can continue, then he must be powerful enough to decide that it's not going to continue if he so chooses. If he's powerful enough to create, he can be powerful enough to destroy, can't he? And so these are not very comforting when you think about it because that we know there's something wrong. We know that we struggle. But there's something wrong with us. A man has an artist for a dad. His dad is amazing. His dad has works of art in museums all across the world. And this man loves to go look at the paintings that his dad has done. He can go to a museum and sit there and stare at one of his dad's paintings for hours. And sometimes he's moved to tears because of how beautiful they are and how much they mean to him. But when his dad calls, he doesn't pick up. When his dad writes, he doesn't open the letter. When his dad shows up at the house and knocks on the door, he doesn't open up. Would you say that this man has a good relationship with his dad? Not in the slightest. Brothers and sisters, God has written us one doozy of a letter called the Bible. Would we pretend to have a relationship with him without opening it? But maybe, maybe we're scared of what we'll find out when we do. Maybe we know what's coming once we hear what that Bible has to say. Maybe we're frightened to hear that there is something wrong with us because we know that's what the Bible says. Maybe we don't want the light to be shined down on our sin. And so maybe we would prefer to just go on a nature walk and commune with God that way and then call it good because we don't want the confrontation. Brothers and sisters, we already confessed in the liturgy this morning that there is something wrong with us. We confessed our sin at the beginning of the service. And then we, when we prayed the Lord have mercy, we opened up, about how the, uh, opened up about the fact that without God's mercy, we are nothing. These are realities that we can't escape. But here's the thing. God is not just powerful. God is not just wise. He is both of those things, for sure. But God loves you. Of all the amazing art works of art God has done on the planet, you are one of them. God created you. God knit you together in your mother's womb. You are here because God has put you here. You are created from God's power, from his intelligence, and you are loved with a love that you cannot understand, an unconditional love. You see, God is your artist dad, and he wants a relationship with you. God wants so much more for you than for you to just admire him at a distance like a fan. God does not want fans. He wants children. And so that's why he wrote you that letter in his word. To tell you, yeah, that there's a problem with you. To tell you, yes, that sin exists and it's in your heart. But to tell you what he's done about it. 
to tell you about his love that sent Jesus down from heaven to live among us and to go to the cross. And then, the God who set the earth on its axis, who holds all things together, to whom all the laws of nature submit, he did something that goes against every law of nature when he walked out of the tomb, when he defeated death and the devil and your sin for you. You have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You have God's love through Jesus Christ. And you learn about this through his word. Through what David calls the law, God's precepts, his statutes, the things that create the fear of the Lord, the ways God communicates to us. And what are the effects of the ways God communicates to us? Revival, David says. Giving light to the eyes, changing your life because a relationship with God changes everything. This is more precious to you than the purest gold you could possibly find. More exciting and more valuable to you if you are randomly chosen for a sweepstakes at your favorite store. This is sweeter than walking in the desert and finding honey out of, a, out of the honeycomb. Sweeter than your cheat day on your diet when you pour yourself a bowl of fruity pebbles or whatever you like. A good, wholesome, righteous relationship with God is more than any of us deserve, more than we could ask for, but it's given to us for free through Jesus and revealed to us in his word. The healthiest relationship is one where both partners can disagree. If we're talking about a friendship or a marriage. Let's say a marriage. The healthiest kind of marriage is the one in which the wife can say to the husband, you know what, honey, I'm not sure if what you said is exactly true. And the husband will keep his cool. Because the foundation of that relationship is love, is confidence, is safety. And one disagreement or one opposing viewpoint is not going to sink their entire marriage. That's a healthy relationship. A healthy relationship is one in which both people can contradict each other and still be okay. That's God to you, brothers and sisters. You have a healthy relationship with God. Let God contradict you. Let God speak through his word to tell you that, yeah, we have problems sometimes. Yeah, sometimes our behaviors and our thoughts and our speech do not give him glory. Let him tell you that because he loves you. And don't worry for a second that your sin is so great that he will give up on forgiving you. Don't you think for a second that God is going to run away from you because you're too ugly of a person. No, look to Christ. He has shown you his love. He has shown you his grace. You have a lot of people in your life whose opinion matters a lot. Your teacher's opinion of your essay matters a lot because they're the ones that's going to give you the grade. Your mom's opinion about how well you cleaned your room matters because she's the one who's going to tell you to do it again if you didn't do it well enough. Your government's opinion of your actions matters because if you do something they say you can't do, you might, get, you might go to jail. We have all these opinions to worry about, all these people double-checking us and assessing us, but don't forget, in the midst of it all, God's opinion matters the most. God's approval matters the most. But here's the thing. You already have it. You already have God's approval. You already have an A-plus in God's eyes through Jesus Christ. Because he's paid for all of your sins. He has clothed you in the robe of his righteousness. When God looks at you, he says, perfect, great, I approve. And so you're safe. You're safe to submit your decisions, your desires, and your actions to God's review because he's not going to punish you. He's going to grow you. You're safe and you're free 
to pray along with David at the end of our psalm. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Always. Amen.